Well, welcome to the Way of Christ Ministries. I'm Brother Harvey Smith. Um, I'm actually doing this uh, video as a response to a comment that we had received. Uh, and unfortunately, I didn't see the comment. It was made several months ago. Uh, but there was a question uh, made by John that he wanted to have a greater explanation of Acts chapter 20, verse 29 through 30. And John, I thought that this was really an awesome request because this deals with a very serious subject in the church. And so I wanted to take some time to make sure that we address this. Uh, it's a great teaching point, and if uh, you know, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, you actually see if you put the scriptures together, uh, the letters that Paul wrote and uh, the things that happen in Acts, it's really neat to study that way. Uh, if you get the time to do that, to try to put everything in time and place, it's really great to see those things and how the things that Paul did and then the churches he wrote and how things were affected that. And you can see that in the book of Acts, which is primarily, a, we take it really as a kind of a history book uh, of the church uh, written by uh, Dr. Luke. Uh, and... Uh, so I wanted to address that with you. Now, the scripture that you asked about in Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 29 and 30, it reads as the following. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. And that's a pretty serious thing this, that uh, Paul's talking about. And it's so serious and so um, expectant that we see it happen a lot in these churches, in church today. And it's a shameful thing that churches get divided. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the things that Paul's talking about. But I thought we'd put a little context into it. And if we look back through the rest of the chapter... Um, looks like I think starting in about verse 17 we see uh, it says and from my lettuce he sent uh, to Ephesus and called the elders of the church and so this is who he's talking to Paul is talking to the elders of the church at Ephesus um, so these would be their pastors deacons and then others that were uh, probably teachers and that kind of thing but at any rate we know he was talking with those who were in charge or, of maintaining the church and Paul tells them, um, first, when you start off throughout these, this chapter in the context, Paul starts off when he gets them there, he starts telling them, hey, you know who I am. Okay, you know that I've always been with you. I've endured. And if you look through this chapter, you'll see these things in there. But I've endured things with you. I have been with you uh, through good times and bad times. We've withstood temptations together. You've seen the temptations I've gone through. You've seen my trials. You've seen my infirmities. You saw how, uh, how uh, the Jews sought to kill me and how they wanted to deliver me over for trials and things like this. Uh, so Paul is identifying with them, letting them know that he is their true teacher from God. Um, but he says, because of this, all these things, you know, you could trust these things that I've not hidden anything from you. But I've told you the whole truth. I told you everything that you need to have life and to be successful, to walk a Christian life. And Paul tells him, I haven't hid these things from you. I taught you about salvation. It is by grace, and that's all that's needed, and that is available to both the Jews and to the Greeks. And that's one of these things that, as we see in the context, bringing in what Paul is actually talking about. He's talking about the true gospel. And he prepares them, like Jesus did his disciples. Paul is now preparing his disciples for Christ, that he's no longer going to be with them. He prepares them that he will not return. His conscience, though, he says, is clear. Knowing that he's not coming back, knowing that they know everything that he knows concerning Christ and the necessity that they have in him, that his conscience is clear that he has done a good job at telling them everything that they have to know, that he's taught them everything and that there are no errors in his teachings and that he has conveyed to them directly. And he already knows 
that they know the whole truth. Okay, Paul lived with him for three years uh, before, and then he came back and visited him again. And so we see, you know, that Paul is, knows these things about them, that they've received the truth and they know it and they know how to walk in the truth, that they shouldn't be easily persuaded into some other gospel, unlike the Corinthians, maybe. But he warns them. And this is where we come into verse 28, 29. He warns them that they are, uh, first of all, that they are the ones who are ordained, okay, by the Holy Spirit as the elders of the church. And he says that they're responsible uh, to care for the flock. And they are the pastors, the deacons, the teachers. They're the ones who are supposed to take this message that Paul gave them concerning Christ and deliver it to the church to maintain it and to keep it going. And because he also wants to make them to be aware that there's false teachers will be coming. And uh, before we get into that more, I want to kind of look a little bit further into here. In verse 29, um, we can see in here where he says, For I know this, <clears throat> that, another, that after my departing, after my departing, I think I'm going to keep on right now, uh, Paul is a great, strong, biblical influence in that church. He is uh, the, one of the founders of the church. I think it was actually founded by Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, and then Paul came in to help reinforce that. Uh, but at any rate, I'm sorry, my camera is flickering. Uh, but at any rate, we can see that Paul, though, has a great influence as an apostle to that church, to the Gentiles. And he has strong biblical influence. He was a great teacher. He was strong in the Jew, uh, Jew, uh, Jewish customs. He was a Pharisee before he, beca he felt it became to Christ. And so we see that he is very thoroughly rooted. Uh, not only was he a Pharisee, he was a Pharisee taught by one of the great teachers of Judaism. And we can see that. He would have given them great instructions and things. And he had a great uh, mind of the scripture and how it related to Christ. Uh, how the Old Testament told about things of Christ. Now, remember, the New Testament wasn't written yet, but he knew these things and taught them all the things concerning Christ in the Scriptures. And what we're going to see is that something that we see nowadays in modern churches. Paul says, when I'm gone, when my influence has left, that strong biblical influence has left, that properly dividing the Word of God, is going to go away. You understand? If they don't maintain it. Because they already know everything they need to know. So it's up to them now. To be that strong biblical influence in the church. But what we see oftentimes Is whenever a pastor or someone leaves a church. That that church goes through a, whole, a period of adjustment. And if there isn't strong leadership that comes right in. And steps up and, and continues to affirm the word of God. Then someone else will. Someone who shouldn't, a false teacher, someone who's just looking to glorify themselves. And so we have to keep our eye out for those kinds of things. But without the strong biblical influence, a church falls open uh, to satanic attack. And the best way for the uh, Satan to get in there is the same as way he did in the garden when he first confronted Eve. He said, ah, yay, did God say? Are you sure that's what God said? Did he really say that? Did he mean that? Are you sure? And so that's what he's going to use. He's going to use false teachers. And they're going to they're going to challenge the elders. They're going to stand up. And they're going to tell, well, that's not the, that's not the what it means, or that's not what it says, or that's not the way we do things, or you know, we need to change the way that was done. And they're going to change it up, and they're going to confront these elders when they don't have a right to. They're going to challenge the doctrines of the church and of the scriptures. They're going to question if what uh, a doctrine of the church is being held is actually scriptural or not. And even though the elder may show it uh, as being scriptural, then they're going to do these things. Well, that's your interpretation. And so that's why we need to have good, strong teachers and good, strong pastors and good, strong deacons. Ones who know the word of God, who can't be confounded by someone who knows it and is misusing it. False teachers, they pervert the truth. They twist. That's what this means in here. 
when he says in here, also show your, um, sorry, shall men arise speaking perverse things. Now, he's not necessarily talking, what he's talking about is blasphemies, but he's not talking about that they're going to have maybe foul language or something like that. I would imagine they're probably going to have really good language, and they're going to be sneaky about their language, and they're going to twist the truth. They're going to pervert it, make it say things that it doesn't say, or take away things from it that it does say. They're going to use the word of God, and they're going to twist it, and they're going to make it say things to suit their purposes. And I'm sure you've all seen they'll take things out of this text, which is why we didn't want to do that this today. We wanted to go ahead and get back and get back to what's going on in the situation, why Paul had to give this warning. He's not telling them that they are doing these things. He's telling them that when I'm gone, these things are going to arise, and he wants them to be aware and be alert to be looking for it. So they're going to uh, circumvent the truth. They're going to find a way around what the truth is, even though they know what it is. And they're going to cause, this is going to cause divisions in the church. They do these through these false teachings. They do it through backbiting. They do it through gossip, hearsay. All these things are what a false teacher uses to divide a church. And they'll play favorites. You know, I like this guy more than that guy. And we don't want to do that. I'm sorry this camera keeps refocusing on you. I guess next time I'll have to use a different one. But those are the kind of things that he's going to do as a false teacher. And there may be several different ones. Uh, but typically you'll find there's one uh, that starts out with murmurings and backbitings and dropping little innuendos. And then it grows up into uh, that they could teach that class better or that teacher doesn't know what he's saying. And they pull people aside and they tell them things. That aren't in the scripture or they rebuke the teacher they confront the teacher without even actually talking to the teacher instead they talk to the students the pupils the disciples and so those are the things that we should be looking for false teachers are people that are from in and without of the congregation but the most deadly ones are for one of those are to come from within the congregation they wait for an opportunity and they when the opportunity see, comes in, that little gap between the strong biblical teacher and pastor going away and then the new one coming in or the new one take, assuming the responsibility, the one ordained by God, this guy will try and jump in and take advantage of that little time frame that maybe they're in between. And he'll try to change the pulse of the church, get their eyes off of who they should be on and put it on themselves. These are always people in the church who have, and uh, not as there's these, but there's going to always be people in the church that have itchy ears. They want to hear something. They don't like what that preacher said. They don't like the truth that he told. So they're going to listen to this other guy who tells uh, things that he wants to say that he knows that people are going to listen to. Half doctrines, half truths is what he's going to give. Everyone, you can't judge me. Everyone has to love, and in love means you can't judge, because if you judge, then you're breaking what Jesus said about judge not that you be not judged. But he didn't tell the whole truth that Jesus is talking about hypocrisy. He's not talking necessarily about being about being judgeful of sin, but he's talking about being a hypocritic, right? Being one who sins and points out others' sins, one who's not aware of himself. But, this, but deflects the attention to someone else. Those kinds of judgments are what we're not supposed to do. But of course we're supposed to confront sin, especially in the church. Look through Paul's writings. Look what he says about that kind of stuff. Uh, Corinthians is a great place to find out about that. So then uh, he goes through, and Paul, and he's telling us these things, warning about these things about the church, that these false teachers are going to come, and that people are going to follow them. Because they want to listen to these things that the people say that shouldn't be teaching. They're not providing the right word, the word of God correctly. Um, Paul's letting them know that it is an elder's duty to constantly uh, be on watch against these false teachers. And it's their responsibility of the elders to confront these false teachers you don't let false teachings continue in your church you don't let it happen 
If someone is teaching false doctrines, they need to be confronted. And if they will not stop, then they need to be removed from the presence of the believers because they are clearly not a believer. They are an agent sent by the enemy. It is the elder's responsibility to know what is being taught, who is teaching, and what, what they're teaching as far as you know doctrinal truths and all that kind of stuff. If you put someone... Uh, pastor or uh, elder, if y'all uh, deacons, if y'all approve someone as a teacher, you need to vet them the same way you do a pastor coming into your church. You need to make sure, one, that they are saved. Um, if you're, uh, you need to make sure that they have followed the Lord's baptism and they are in compliance and obedience to the Spirit of God. And you also need to, doesn't hurt to make sure what teachings and what doctrines that they actually intend to teach. And how to do it. I was sitting on some classes. I would have them teach me a class first. I would have them teach me a, a, a class at least. A minimum on the grace of Jesus Christ. And if they can't explain that. Then they probably need to be educated. Before they become a teacher. They might need to be saved. Before they become a teacher. There's plenty of people in classrooms today. That are teaching classrooms and churches. That are not saved. That uh, think that Christ is not the only way. And that they think that uh, salvation can be obtained. Through a combination of works and grace. And so those are things that Paul uh, confronted over and over again in his epistles. And those are false doctrines. So we need to make sure that we have an understanding of those things. Now it's apparent that. It, it seems to me uh, that he, the Ephesians church looked or listened to Paul when he said these warnings about uh, the men coming and rising and speaking perverse things and drawing away disciples after them. The Ephesian church, if you look through the epistles that Paul wrote, the Ephesians is one of the few ones that he wrote that was it's a totally, it's, it's a good letter. Um, it goes through and talks about uh, the expansion of, of, of building on the faith that you have in salvation and how it works and how you can uh, get, I don't want to say get better at it, but how you can build upon it, build upon that foundation. Paul explains those things when he writes to the Ephesians. In other letters, he writes, he, he writes to other churches and he says, I can't believe how soon you've fallen away from the grace of Jesus Christ or from the doctrines that you were taught, from the gospel that you were given into another gospel, which isn't a gospel. That's what he says to other churches. But to the church in Ephesus, when you look through the letter there, he writes, it looks like they may have paid attention because he writes on greater things. He writes on things that has to do with the role of the church, the mystery of Christ, the spiritual gifts, uh, the, the bride of Christ. He explains things even in more depth and gives us a lot of good doctrine upon the church and how the church should be living and individuals and the church as an organization. So I just want you to know that, you know, these uh, things will come. These people will come into churches. These false teachers, these agents of Satan will come into there. But you can resist them. By confronting them with the truth, the spirit of uh, the Holy Spirit and the doctrines and with, um, excuse me, sound doctrine and with properly dividing the word of God and, and bringing the word of God uh, to them in a thoughtful manner. And if they reject that, then you have to do use church discipline and you have to remove them from the presence. For certain, for sure, you have to stop them from being a teacher. Uh, and if they get their feelings hurt, well, I'm sorry about that. But your duty is to the church itself, to the disciples, to the young believers. And I say young, I don't just mean in age. I mean in spiritual age so that those can grow and grow and get off the uh, beautiful, sincere milk of the gospel. But they can go on to deeper things like Paul teaches about in the book of Ephesians. So I hope that this has been a good enough explanation to you about those two verses and i hope that you are able to pick up a little bit more if you have any other questions about it or part of it wasn't quite clear that i was talking about uh please go ahead and put it in your comments and uh i will try to pay closer attention to our comments in the future to make sure i get you the answers you require that you require sooner all right god bless you